This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I am just so excited because I will be interviewing a very talented classic character actor from so many cult classic films, and I am talking about Daryl Larson. Daryl has been in so many great movies from The Student Nurses to Koch to Future World to Francis to um, to um, Aaron Lipstadt directed films, Android City Limits. He was in Fairy Tale Theater of Little Red Riding Hood, which is where I first saw him as a kid. And of course, he was the dead body in Men at Work with Charlie Sheen, Emilio Estevez, classic, hilarious comedy. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about his his career, those films, you know, guest starring on television and everything else um, that he is involved in. And it's going to be spectacular. We are supposed to do this interview last week, but he had to um, reschedule. And it's going to be awesome. So yeah, here is my interview with Daryl Larson. Hey Daryl. Hey man, I'm sorry. I was <clears throat> I, I was on the phone. It doesn't matter, but <laughs> I can't say no to these people. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah. Hello. That, that's hi, man. That's thank per- you for your patience. Absolutely, that's perfectly all right. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. <laughs> Well, honor may be too strong a word, but I I, I appreciate it very much. <laughs> awesome, uh, awesome. Well, you know, it, what's interesting about my life, um, or whatever you call it, my especially my professional life, is that stuff has survived that. Yeah. I'm gratified, but no, I didn't expect. Right. I don't think. You know it, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the primary example would be Mike's murder, that <laughs> we made it, we made it with, with, uh, it was very personal to all of us, yeah. mattered a lot, and it was, uh, you know, um, very appropriate to its moment mm-hmm. in Hollywood, because oh, yeah. Coke was a epidemic. Oh, yeah. And, um... Our parts were written for us, uh, which is very unusual. I mean, we were all three, uh, Paul and Winger and I were very close to Jim Bridges, and those parts were written specifically for us. When does that happen? Um, (laughs) Then when it opened, it didn't do well. it. It, I mean, Pauline Kale loved it, and right. you mentioned, I mean, there were people who loved it and championed it, but it was gone in two weeks. Yeah. Warner Brothers had a movie called Tightrope yep. with Clint Eastwood that they were big on. So mm-hmm. they just took us all out. We took, they just took it out of the theaters and put Tightrope in. Yeah. And that, we thought, that was it for the movie then kind of heartbreaking yeah the I, damn thing has become a cult movie I hear from people on Facebook you know once a week saying that movie made a lot of sense you know blah blah I don't mean to say blah blah yeah. that, that that movie made it meant a lot to me I had one guy write me a letter a letter letter to say that he got off drugs because he watched that movie and it saved his life yeah that's good. Well, I'm like, is it, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's good. That makes so so that sort of thing is a shock to me. But I'm certainly, as I say, it's very gratifying. And that movie has a, a power. Yeah, I don't think I've talked to a single person who, who who thought that that you know they would have such longevity. You know that their film would uh, you know stand the test of time, but. Um, Yes, like I said, you know, I mean, it's it's an honor for me, and um, I'd like to go back in time and ask you: Did did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Yes, uh, you know, in uh, sixth grade, 
I played Scrooge in the Christmas Carol at our elementary school. And um, because the, <laughs> the guy said, you have the lo loudest voice. But the truth is, I knew he knew that I could actually play Scrooge. My very first line was, Cratchit, put that wood back. <laughs> so I can remember the, the first line I ever, ever spoke. But then I did, you know, children's theater, uh, you, you know, teenagers doing children's theater. I played Aladdin. I played Candlewick in Pinocchio, who's the bad boy, mm -hmm. setting up that pattern. I often played the bad kid who, who uh, sort of, um, you know, pulled the good kid off the beaten, the, uh, the, the good road, um, the, the tempter. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just kept, I, my, my high school didn't have a theater department. And yet we did five plays because I wanted, because <laughs> I made it happen. <laughs> nice. And like that. So you stood up and, and said, I, I, I want a theater company here in, in, in you know, school. And they, they listened to you. I just got a sponsor. I was a prominent kid as it was. You know, uh, pr the president of the student council, that kind of stuff. And mm. I had a lot of friends and who would would help me with co you know with several of them wanted to be in theater so i just formed alliances i got a teacher to be the you know the the sponsor <laughs> and we just we did um all kinds of interesting stuff actually uh, one of the one of them being uh do you remember the movie david and lisa i remember hearing that, about it yeah Frank Perry. It was Keir DeLay's debut, as a matter of fact. It was about a kid who couldn't be touched and a girl who wouldn't speak, even though she had nothing wrong with her physically. Right. And they were in this, an institution, and of course they'd fall in love and draw each other out. There, there was a play version almost immediately, and and we did that, and I played David and co-directed, and, and the, the, it was a sweet little production. It won awards. We, you know, we went to several one-act festivals and and uh, were the big hit. So I always had a lot of support, mm -hmm. not necessarily from my family, but from my friends. Mm -hmm. And we organized the, this uh, the shopping mall. The, the department store had a corner that gave us to build a theater in. And we did a ridiculous show called Alice in Oz in which Alice goes down the wrong rabbit hole and ends <laughs> up in Oz. <laughs> <laughs> That's so perfect. We had all kinds of kids who wanted parts and so now we have a lot of parts. And, and that was that sort of thing uh, I could do and I'm still in a way doing it. I never stopped doing that sort of uh being the uh, inciting uh, person in these kinds of, I mean, I've done a lot of theater and um, all over in New York and here and in San Francisco and my whole life. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about money, it was about the joy of telling stories for people. Yeah, I'm born and raised in uh, San Francisco. Uh, when did you live there? Well, uh, I didn't really live there. I just went there to do plays. There was a couple of theaters there that, that I worked at. And um, and my grandmother lived there, so I grew up going there. You know, I hung mm. out in the hate when it was hippie central. Yeah. I graduated from high school in 1968. Mm -hmm. And within a couple of years, I was at UCLA, I started working in show business. Yeah. And... Uh, and that, you know, and I never really looked back. I didn't graduate from college because I was too busy working, especially at Universal. I did all that. You know, the Wellbe was the first professional job I had ever, and I took two more Wellbe's, and you know, the, the things just sort of followed along. And I look back now, and I see how fortunate I was. At the time, I thought I was struggling like everybody else, but the truth was, 
Um, I was working a lot mm-hmm. in that '80s television that, that stuff. After after oh. after high school, though, um, uh, while you're like studying acting, what, did any of your classmates go on to become successful? Sure. I mean, I, I, keep in mind, I I went to college at seventeen, mm-hmm. so I was really really young. But I worked with I mean, people that then yes did work regularly, like after after that, like Lee Purcell, and the very first job I, I had was uh, Chorus Leachman was in it, and Bill Schaller. Right. And, uh, and of course, Robert Young. And, and I, worked with, I worked with Robert Young four, five more times because he dug me, really liked me, and he liked having me around. So, so uh, but in terms of people, um, Cindy Williams is probably the most successful that I was around right away. Do you remember Annette O'Toole? Oh, yes. So and I was in, in a acting class with Annette. We had big crushes on each other. <laughs> we did Romeo and Juliet and stuff. <laughs> and, um, and, as, you know, and then as I started working with many of those people, Joe Beth Williams I worked with, and, um, and then when I was doing theater in, in the 80s in L.A., I worked with Ed Harris and uh, who else in that cast would, would have... I did oh, and Helen Shaver, the oh, yeah. play I directed, and uh, I, a, a guy named... Remember Little Anthony and the Imperials? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Anthony wanted to be an actor. <laughs> Anthony Gordine is his name. And so I... He, I did a play with him and, uh, and Ed. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of people that I know or knew back then, even like Jim, Jimmy Gammon and Amy Madigan and Holly Hunter and Arms Howard, Alfred Woodard, and these are all people that I did theater with. Mm-hmm. I also did, you know, uh, certainly did movies. Um, Winger being one of them, but um, my ongoing sort of the, the the river that I was in and was going with the current of was theater, and, and usually kind of progressive uh, experimental theater. Um, but but I kept working. I kept uh, you know I worked with Bill Bixby in a great little thing called Congratulations, It's a Boy. Mm-hmm. A lot of people still know that one too. <laughs> um, and and he, that was that was one of those uh, an introducing yeah. <laughs> thing. And and Anne Southern was in it for God's sake. Yeah, and wow. Jack <laughs> Jack Albertson. Oh yeah. And 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 Bill and Diane Baker and people like that. So I found myself at 18, 19, 20 years old, working with these people I'd grown up with. Eve Arden, people like that. that I, and I was just, uh, I worked with Mercedes McCambridge once. Yeah. And we just sat and talked about James Dean for the whole six days. And uh, Shirley Jones was in that, and Bill Wyndham. So <laughs> David Cassidy, her son, I was friends with, and obviously he was, huge for about 10 minutes <laughs> and 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 but a sweet guy I, I very rarely met people you know if i do a gun smoke and it's james arness and melbourne stone and they were fantastic yeah chorus after my very first scene everybody knew this might get my first gig you know mm. uh, applauded and 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 the which let you know, sort of led the crew in welcoming this need to show business. Nice. Um, so there's that, there's a sweetness in show business that people, I don't think people really get. Yeah. That we're all in it together and it's a family, which is one of the reasons I wanted to be in it to begin with. Mm-hmm. Because there's a sense back, you know, when you're working together like that for weeks and then 
start performing it together, and there's just a bond that is unlike anything. And you get it on a movie, too. I must uh, the, I was in a movie with Blythe Danner, and we're, we remained friends all these years. I haven't talked to her in a little while, but... Or I played Blair Brown's brother in Molly Dodd, and we stayed friends. Nice. And, it, you know... Um, I was just, in fact, I wrote a little thing that's on Facebook about Natalie Wood, mm -hmm. um, that I worked with her on a movie called Brainstorm and, and Chris Walken. Yeah. Uh, and, in fact, it was while making that movie that she died. Yep. And so I had this experience. I don't know. Take a look at it. It's on Facebook. It'll give you an idea. Oh, actually, uh, I... Brianna I... Wood <clears throat> friended me the other day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I mean, it's just fascinating what what Facebook brings to us. Yeah. Anyway, I'm 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 just riffing on whatever you ask me, but okay. as to whether people in those because you got to keep in mind also, I didn't like, I didn't go to acting class. Mm -hmm. I just started acting. Yeah. And similarly, um, I uh, I've learned while doing. I, I often said I, I went to the Universal Studios acting school because I, I did all those shows. Mm -hmm. and, and I was learning. I did eventually go to acting classes and studied with some great teachers, but it was more about learning by doing. Yeah. Especially in terms of lenses. Because they didn't, for many, many years, they didn't really teach film acting. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, acting was yeah. acting, and the, uh, the idea that they were different. Now, obviously, it, in the heart of it, they're the same. But but there's there are some very important differences. I did teach at Columbia for mm -hmm. a dozen years, uh, directing actors for film mm -hmm. in, in the graduate film department, uh, and. It's very important to know those differences. So Certainly. I kind of learned that from Jim Bridges. Your your f first movie that was uh, listed on DriveDB is uh, the Student Nurses. How was that experience? Yes. Uh, well, it was wonderful. Uh, it was uh, Julie Corman mm -hmm. uh, wanted her own little company, and and sh she was great actually. Um, and so, you know, uh, Roger Corman set her up and, you know, uh, this was her first production. Right. And they were meant to be these, you know, four sexy girls. And I think she also did, um, <laughs> she also did stewardesses and, you know, like that. Yeah. They, there was always, uh, every once in a while, a flash of breast and that sort of thing in those movies. And in this one, I played a kid who was dying of cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So most of my stuff is in a bed, and one of the nurses falls for me. And that clearly I'm going to die without get, having sex. Mm -hmm. And it was <laughs> Elaine Giftos, the actress. Yeah. Just a heart, sweetheart. And um, she, the, care, the, the nurse, gets in bed and fucks him. Yeah. <laughs> and, because, you know, on his way out. And actually, in the movie, the next day he died. Right. So she fucked him to death. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, th yeah, uh, that was that was so much fun. And <laughs> I, I, was, I didn't know, I didn't remember that it was my actually my first movie. Mm -hmm. I think because I'd done so many, so much TV and I... I think Congratulations to Boy was a TV movie, so it felt like a movie. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, it didn't feel like my first movie. It was quite a wild shoot, though. They, we were in a kind of abandoned hospital uh, out in wherever, uh, South L.A., can't remember. Anyway, we had the whole hospital. We, we, we weren't using all of it, so there were all these... <laughs> this, this is so outrageous. These 
long hallways and these rooms way out back in there. Mm-hmm. And there was quite a bit of sex going on back in those rooms. Uh, and so the, the AD, the, the, the director, the assistant directors had to go out there and kind of walk the halls calling out names. <laughs> Oh, it was really fun. Yeah. Really fun. I talked to uh, Pepe Serna, who was in the movie, too. He was in Student Nurses? He was, yeah. He had a small part in there. I never remembered that. I love Pepe. He's a good guy. He's a very good guy, yeah. Also, Renny Santoni, who just passed away. He was a great actor. He was. I did a play with Renny. Uh, he was a handful. Yeah. <laughs> gotta say. I mean, I love the guy, but he was really a handful. Yeah. Barbara. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, one of those actors that is, um, really wants to make sure you know how great he is. Yeah. <laughs> those New York actors. And he was great. He was great, though. But he didn't need to do this, this you know, twist on it. We knew, we knew. And we were lucky to have him, and we knew that, too. Um, so in that, George Papard, that production, the next play we did there, uh, mm-hmm. he, George did a one-man show called Terrible Jim Fitch. Yeah. By Hurley, I think is the playwright's name. And I was directing a, another play on this this bill we were presenting, the mm-hmm. kind of rep plays. We had a big play that, that I took up most, Are You Looking, actually, which was starring in Harris and Helen Shaver, and, as I said. And on the other, the sort of off nights, we had these one these one person shows, and this uh, one of George's really was featured, obviously. We had George Bavard in a play. I mean, obviously it wasn't, you know, in, in his prime, it, but he, there he was, and uh, did a hell of a job, worked really hard, but I wasn't officially directing it, and he didn't want a director. Yeah. Uh, and he was very kind of huffy about it. The whole <laughs> idea that we thought he needed one. So he was in there about a week, and uh, he said, we, he came to me, and kind of hat in hand, and said, would you come and, you know, sit? <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I don't have to say a word to you, but just having somebody there, that'll help you. Eventually, he was very open and, you know, uh, and did a great job, but, uh, tried, you know, had, had to get sober and work really hard to get sober, mm-hmm. um, and he did, and, and he did, as I say, he did a really fine job. He was bitter. He was yeah. bitter, though. Oh, yeah, bitterness creeps up in the industry. It really does. <laughs> well, exactly. And George was at such a level in the, in the you know, and, it, and he plummeted, which many people do, too. Yeah. Um, you guest starred on uh, Bonanza. How was that experience? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and I met a lifelong friend, Heather Menzies. Oh, in that she married yeah. Bob Urich and yeah. uh, Heather was was like my sister and um, although we did have a little bit of a sexual thing uh, because everybody <laughs> did then yeah. <laughs> with everybody and but I loved her I loved her you know I still love her and, although she passed away some years a couple of years ago um, she was in it and then <laughs> this was really a kick we go up to Lake Arrowhead which is where they had the Ponderosa you know as acres of woods and and the the, the house was up and up there and and, um, and and Michael Landon right from the beginning made it clear he thought this script was shit yeah <laughs> by then you know was way into it and, and he was a very bright and very funny uh, hip guy, and he knew how to do this shit, mm-hmm. and it wasn't good. It was the same old, same old, and so he kind of hated it. But the plot was that my father and I uh, get uh, attacked by outlaws, or whatever, and and he said, you know, that kind of thing. But he just said over the weekend, he said he and Virgil Vogel was the director. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, forget it. Uh, we're throwing. 
this out. We're going to write a new one. And they did. And we come in on Monday. They used all the same characters because they didn't want any of us to lose our job. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But, yeah. <laughs> but they used those characters and wrote a better script, much better script. But it was like the old days when they were doing westerns in that they'd go, okay, you guys run up over that hill and, and you come in with the wagon just coming down there. And then they say, and here's what's got to happen in the scene. And a lot of it was the dialogue was more or less improvised. Yeah. It was so much fun. And you could get that, you had that feeling of what they, how it used to be, you yeah. know. Um, and uh, Michael was, ha- was just happy as he could be in that kind of situation and very creative. But, it, but he also was a practical joker. So yeah. at one point, there was, there was my father and I, but where was mom? You know, there was, it was, there was no mention of her even. So yeah. at one point, he, we're, we pull up and we're having a scene. We are in a wagon and Michael's on the ground. And he, and he kind of goes, wait, is that your mother? And under the huge stone rock, he had placed... Like in Wizard of Oz, like the witch's feet mm-hmm. sticking out, he placed some, some the, obviously the prop guys, put these legs and shoes poking out under the rock. Yeah. So we tried it all together, but finally we couldn't. Because he went on with the scene. Hey, is that, your, is that your mother? And then he just went on, and we're, what? And, it, it, and then the crew just cracked up. Uh, the whole thing was... <laughs> fun like that. Wow, that's, a, uh, and, that's awesome. And Lauren was kind of Lauren. I mean, a guy named Lauren, yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> he's got a kind of pomposity, and, but funny as hell. And he was very foul-mouthed. Yeah. And um, cocksucker this, and motherfucker that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> loud with that booming voice. Yeah. And, um, uh, um, chores would hike up through the woods because they knew, oh, bananas being shot up in there. Mm. They couldn't drive up because they were gated stuff. They'd climb up the mountain and stand around in the woods. And here he is, Ben Cartwright, swearing up a storm. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> the guy playing my father said, you know, Lauren, uh, might blow your energy. He said, fuck him. It's our <laughs> mountain. So that was Lauren. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, Dan Blocker was around. I wish he hadn't. Been. I think he was ill already. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, that was my my experience with that. And uh, Gunsmoke. Um, yeah, I got around to a lot of stuff there that I'd grown up with. Uh, yeah. Most principally, Robert Young, who was literally. I wished was my father. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my father came down specifically because I, you know, just to kind of visit the set, even though we, we never got along and he wasn't yeah. happy about show business, he was a Mormon. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> so while we were shooting, though, Robert knew about this because we had already gotten quite close in the first thing first show within a few days he we had started we had started having real conversations he had you know been an alcoholic and he gotten sober and we have you know intimate kind of i was kind of shocked but also not i i thought he would be this kind of man mm-hmm. uh you know he would have every morning he we would have a moment of silence not not uh, religious, you know, not like a prayer. Although I think he did, was praying. He just, yeah. the whole company would would be quiet together for a minute, which is a long time, really. Mm-hmm. And the, that's how it started together. I, I've never had that experience again in show business, but it was a remarkable thing to do. Yeah. And it really shows what a great man he was. But anyway, my father's there, and Bob went over to him 
and said, I just want you to know, and I hope you understand this, what, what a great person your son is and, and what, a, what a good human being you have raised. And it just <laughs> blew me away. But yeah. if you take the time to do it um, is one thing. But also to make sure that my dad understood that, you know, I was, go- I was a good man. So, yep. yeah, mm-hmm. I've had that kind of wonderful experience all the way through in show business. You're, you're my second... You're my second. You're my second guest from Koch. Oh, that I love. Oh shit! Which was your other? Uh, Deborah Winters. Sure. Well, she was going to have a career. It didn't quite happen, but she's yeah. a lovely woman. She is. She. Ha- okay, my story on that is. Mm-hmm. I get. Okay, you're going to go audition for Jack Lemmon. Yeah. And I go, what? You come on. I mean, I just, I was, I felt like you're in the right place. I felt that like quite a bit in show business where I felt like, yeah, you, you, what a lucky man you are. And so I go down to audition for Jack Lemon. Mm. He's directing it. And uh, I was very nervous, but I went in, I did my best. And, and as I was leaving, I thought, you know what? You're probably never going to get this opportunity again. Turn around and thank the man yeah. <laughs> for the joy and, and the and what you've learned from watching. <laughs> so I did, and he stopped me. I, what, he, I said, I just want you to know how much it's meant to me, and it's just really great to have, just to be in the same room with you. Blah blah. I mean, I meant it, but. Yeah. Um, but I may never get this opportunity again. And he stopped me and he said, you will. I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll get the opportunity on the set. I, I, nobody does that. Where they hire you in the room, mm-hmm. it's just not done. They, they wait, you have to wait, and then they call your agent, blah, and all that kind of thing. But, but he just told me right in the room, you have the part. So <laughs> then, <clears throat> while we're shooting it, you know that scene where she and I are on the couch making out? In mm-hmm. fact, that's when she gets pregnant. Right. And Walter comes up behind us and just stands there. And you kind of, you can, and watching us, you kind of see our, every once in a while my butt comes up in the shot or like that, we're jumping around. And then at a certain point, the, my pants were supposed to fly up in the air. <laughs> Right? right? And so, uh, Walter came over and whispered to me and said, uh, we didn't tell anybody else. We didn't tell Jack, we didn't tell anybody. And he says, can you get that, those pants to hit me in the head? And he gave great brand. <laughs> and I went, oh man, I'll try. You, see, you can just, you, you don't have to uh, uh, do it behind your back. Just look up, because they can't see anyway, and just throw those pants so it hits me yeah. Which I did, first take, boom. And none of them knew it was going to happen, but everybody has to. And Walter, of course, melted. He just stood there. <laughs> he didn't take the pants off. Uh, Arthur said nothing. He just stood there looking at us for many beats. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it is in the movie. And um, yeah. finally, Jack cut because he couldn't stop. He couldn't. He couldn't wait any longer to laugh. He couldn't control himself. Because uh, he could have been there for five minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Again, those kind, that kind of stuff um, makes the whole deal not... Uh, I guess the most gratifying thing is actually when people see it. But to be able to do that with Walter Matthau, and oh, he's playing an old man, much older than he was at the time. Mm-hmm. He's my age now. He's like seventy something in the movie, but in life, he, I look back. He's kind of have been in his mid fifties. When you tell me, how old is he in, in life? Do you know? Who? Uh, who again? Ja- uh, uh, Walter Matthau. Um, at that point in time, he was. Um, I think he was about fifty or so. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He's playing a seventy year old man. Yeah. And. 
but, and beautifully, but he never got out of that. In other words, walking around on the set and stuff, he stayed old. Yeah. <laughs> Sunshine <laughs> Boys. In the Sunshine Boys, he's like 75, but he was like 55 when he made it. Yeah. He, yeah. Can, he could do that. He could do that. But that was purposely why they, why they came up with that movie and had it written and so was so Jack could direct it, and and Walter could play an old man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing that used to happen more. Maybe it is still happening. I don't know. But people would would generate stuff that they wanted to work on, like Mike's murder or. Uh, it, it, Step mom, I'm in step mom, and mm -hmm. Susan and, and uh, Julia wanted to work together, <laughs> and they came up with a premise, right? And they got a script written, and they got ten scripts written. <laughs> you know, I mean, it went through so many things. Even fucking Tim stepped up and thought he could write a better script. That, you know, uh, don't get me started on Tim Robbins. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, the, the, and, of course, Columbus came into it at a certain point. He was a very sweet and generous guy. And Ed, they, mm -hmm. they, he, they offered it to Ed, and he called, called me up and said, because I had directed him many times, and that was our relationship. He said, you know, what do you think? I mean, this is, it's just like this romantic kind of, you know, soap opera movie. Yeah. And I kind of went, no, I thought Mike's, you know, because he considered himself, and he is a great artist, and therefore kind of didn't really want to be a movie star of that sort. He could have been. Right. Especially in that period. And I said, wait a minute, man. You're thinking of turning down a movie with Sid Saran and Julia Roberts now? Do you want to be in movies at all? I mean, come <laughs> on. You have to. Because even if it's, even if it's, like a romantic thing or something. I said to, well, personally, uh, Julie Roberts, I'd do anything to to be in a room with her. Yeah. <laughs> right? right. So uh, sometime later, I get a call from the cast member who I knew very well. And she said, uh, we're trying to, the script was written that the character I played was the silver-haired Englishman. Was how he was described in the script. It's a guy who is kind of Julia's boss, their partner. She's a great photographer, like, you know. <clears throat> Have you seen his demo? Uh, I think I saw it when it first came out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, that's, I just got a, a residual check for that movie of some substance. I mean, uh, gives, the gift keeps on giving. And I loved working with her. I loved working on it. Uh, Chris was great. And it, as an illustration, mm -hmm. uh, Ed did take the part, obviously. And then they did a reading of the script one more time to make some, you know, see if they could get it perfect, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to read all the other characters in the script. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because they didn't want to bring all these folk in. So it just, there was the family. The two kids, Julia and Susan and Ed and Chris, the, we read the script. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Ed, by then, you know, they had, when they called me in uh, to, to do it, she, Susan Arnold was her name, said, we have seen every silver-haired Englishman in, in the world, <laughs> in New York. <laughs> And it's just not working. And I said, "Well, what's the situation?" Because all I knew with from Ed was that it was that it was the two of them, and he was the romantic, uh, divorcing Susan, and then having an affair with Julia. That's all I knew about it. Mm -hmm. But when she ran it down to me, uh, his job, my character, was basically to fire her. That was my function in the script. Uh, it sort of drove it you know, to the end of the third act. And I said, oh, well, I don't want to. So you don't want to do it? I said, no, I don't want to fire Julia Roberts. If I'm 10 feet from her, I want to stay there. As everyone does. And that was what it took. 
really, was to not want to to fire her. Right. People were coming in, auditioning, and firing her. Mm-hmm. And there's no drama in that at all. So they hired, again, they hired me right away. And now we're, we're doing the reading, and Ed says, you're going to sit down here with me. And he would lean over and ask me things about the scene. Yeah. Which was, again, our relationship. What am I doing in this? <laughs> like that to the side. Most directors. Mm-hmm. would never have allowed that. Yeah. They would have been angry at me. They wouldn't have, you know, blamed it. They would be angry at me for, for, you know, presuming to direct their star. And I just, I, I admired him so much because at the break, I went up, I hope you don't mind, he said, are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, this is, <laughs> he, he intimidates me. I want, yeah, you're really helping me, man. And it was like that from then on. And and also, Julia is a dream to work with. Yeah. And I think she's one of the, really, one of the main movie stars of our time. I mean, I'm not saying anything else that I just know, but people put her down. Yeah. You know, they they minimize her, her abilities. Yeah, I, I interviewed they, they her. Mock her. I interviewed her brother, Eric, last year. Oh, I love Eric. Yeah. How is he? How is he anyway? He's great. I mean, he's he works like a dog. You know, that guy's got like 500 movie credits by now. Yeah, I, yeah. Like literally. I mean, he's just, yeah. he just works constantly. Yeah. Uh, I was Mark working. Murder came out. He came up to me at a, at a restaurant. Yeah. And, and which is also an uh, indication of what a good guy he is. Mm-hmm. I came over and to congratulate me. And I said, I'm just, I, was really, I was really, really like, and I'm going, yeah, but you, man, you, and, and he, he shut it down. He said, we're talking about you now. <laughs> and I was just, whoa. He said, you don't know how good you are in that, do you? And I'm, I'm saying, well, I, I certainly know more now. You know? <laughs> uh, but anyway, you were about to say about him. Oh, no, I was just going to say. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, he's, the guy works like a dog. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. I've met him, too, at a convention. Uh, his wife, she's been on the podcast as well. She actually was coming back on, and she, she brought him with her, and it just took me by surprise. I didn't think she would do that, and I thought that was really cool. Who is his wife? Uh, Eliza Garrett. She was in Animal House. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, all those guys. I worked with Tim Matheson. I worked with... With Peter Rieger. Steve, um, Stephen First. Yeah, I never worked with Belushi, but I did coke with him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute, you're recording this. Oh, so now that blows my, my our reputation? Let's, I don't think so. let's, move on, let's move on to Future World. How was that experience? Well, okay. <laughs> um, that's where I met Blythe, and, and we became good friends. Um, she had just had Gwyneth. Mm-hmm. And she would not let the, anybody else wash the diapers. <laughs> had to be cloth diapers since it had to be done just right. So I would often help her do the laundry. And uh, and also, you know, have dinner and stuff like that. We got, I really admired her. And I always thought she should be a movie star. And so, and she's wonderful in this. Peter... Peter is a weird guy, mm-hmm. as who could who wouldn't be growing up in show business yeah. like he did, and um, and and kind of distracted. But he was real into guns. He mm-hmm. had a gun collection that he that I don't know maybe a tenth of it was in his trailer, and um, it was just odd. He would bring them onto the set. Now in those days it wasn't any was it was in Texas we were shooting in Houston Texas mm-hmm. uh, or was it Dallas where were we <laughs> anyway <laughs> we was Houston at least for some of it um, and it, it just made people it was unsettling and he seemed unaware of it mm-hmm. um, so there was that and there was his be a guy named Jim Antonio. 
Oh, yeah. Jim Antonio. Yeah. Yeah, and we had, most of my scenes were with him. And we had a great time. You know, the old style comic kind of actor. Yeah. Uh, he seemed like his brother, Blue Antonio, was oh. also in the business. So uh, just director. Um, both good guys. But yeah, Jim, Jim Antonio, uh, interminable interminable uh, shoot and I had a scene in which I I'm setting I'm like a pimp I'm setting uh, the guests up with sex robots and he says his line is well uh, what, are, have you ever had sex with her and I say I'm not programmed for sex <laughs> <laughs> and, and it took me like I don't know ten verses because people everyone was, I mean because let's face it I was yeah especially then and especially in Houston, Texas with all these Texan girls and um, well, I would, the wildest party I ever went to was there forget Hollywood uh, you know? <laughs> so anyway that the line was hilarious in this context and he kept breaking up I, I was holding to get together. I was doing a dead bad, I'm not programmed for sex kind of thing, like yeah. a robot. <laughs> but Jim could not keep himself uh, from, from going, <laughs> sure, sure, and breaking it up. Yeah. Uh, right. So those are my memories of that. Oh, except that. Bruce Paltrow showed up mm -hmm. on the set. Yeah. Because he had heard about me and and uh, uh, Blythe, and I, it, it stunned me because there was absolutely nothing sexual about it, nor would there ever have been. Mm -hmm. she, well, first of all, she's not that kind of woman at all. Yeah, she's sexy, but she's not. You know, she's just not that kind of woman. She's married and she has a baby. For God's sake! And yet, and and, and I, we, I was kind of, why is he here? Because he was very officious, and he was sort of, uh, he, I, was, I had other dealings with him, but he wasn't my favorite person in any case, but this was weird. Yeah. And she finally said to me, he, he, heard, about, he heard about us, our friendship, mm -hmm. and went, you got to be fucking kidding me. That's kind of gross. And, you know, she, did, she didn't agree with, I mean, she, it's not like she went, oh, he's horrible, et cetera. She obviously loved him, and he loved, obviously loved her, because he came all the way to Texas to yeah. check on her. <sighs> so, that's the other detail on that one. I talked to um, Aaron Lipstad uh, last year, and we talked about Android and City Limits. Uh, he's a great, ah. he's a great guy. Um, what drew you to work Fantastic with him? Guy. Yeah, what drew you to work with him? Well, I knew him really well by then. Uh, Barry Opper, who produced it, and Don Opper, who who he, he played the the robot in that one. He wrote it, and he was a really good friend of mine. We'd all had we were part of a theater company together, Barry, called the Provisional Theater, uh, which I kind of joined that group and stopped working for a while in show business mm -hmm. um, to focus that on that and. Um, uh, it was kind of a groundbreaking group, but as I say, very political and very uh, progressive, uh, mm -hmm. uh, experimental. So then, though, I'm living up at Winger's house, and we're shooting the, the some of Mike's murder. We'd already done most of it, but, and they came. So for a minute, I was kind of uh, a, a name ish, and they got a little bit of money, uh, and and Robbie Benson agreed to do it. And James Earl Jones agrees to do it. Uh, um, they they had made Android and had done all right. They had Klaus Kinski, and it was a cute little movie, actually. I saw it not long ago, maybe a few years ago. They had a, a screening of it, um, uh, you know, with the old gang. And it, it was a, a deft movie. And Aaron, you know, had an eye. I mean, and he knew how to make you know, a scene work and drive forward into the next, uh, you know, 
he, he knew how to keep a movie moving. Um, and then uh, uh, Don had another idea of these kids who had grown up with no, who had, who, all the grown ups die on the whole planet, and so they're on their own. And they basically, comic books are their uh, Bibles. That's how they figured out how to. And the, now I play the leader, right? You see, yeah. of the gang, of one gang, the good gang, <laughs> and a kid named Danny De La Paz. Uh, Tony Plana was in sort of the Chicano version of us, and we right. are enemies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, it was it's complicated. It's expensive to have motorcycles and stunts and stuff. Um, yep. And but we also had Kim Cattrall and uh, Ray Don Chong group. Ray Don Chong Stockwell, yeah, yeah, who became a director himself, and uh, we called him Studley because <laughs> he was, you know, he, that's what his job was in the movie to be the, the Studley guy. And Ray Don Chong, who uh, I stayed in contact with for all these years, and while I was in back in New York, she had a got a little thing together to do it. Two TV shows at once set in this town in Maine where she lived. Mm -hmm. And I uh, went up there and worked and played the cop for her in both shows. Um, so there were a lot of relationships in these those, um, those days that were kind of... Um, Wiener came down to that set, actually. Uh, it just to kind of, you know, it was fun to be on sets in those days. Right. I don't know, it probably is still, but it's not the same. Um, so, but Aaron uh, had, had put a lot of uh, faith in me, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, again, we had a lot of fun doing stunts on motorcycles. I, would, I could ride a motorcycle, but <laughs> one, one particular time, the throttle guts, they weren't the best bikes in the world either, you know, I mean, they were cheap. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the throttle got stuck, and this motorcycle went off right towards the cameras and Aaron and everybody else. And I'm, like, trying to hold it and steer it, but basically I'm falling off of it. <laughs> and and I, I, went, I took it down on the side and and slid it right up to, Aaron had turned around like everybody else and run the other way, but I went right up to him. It, it, it was almost to the point of having to jump up over him. <laughs> and he stopped it. And he's standing there going, um, good trick, good trick. <laughs> but we didn't get it. I said, you want me to do it again? He was like, no, fuck no. Uh, but we had, we had, yeah, we had a tremendous amount of fun. Yeah, Aaron. Costumes were really fun. You can see, you can see it. Aaron, Aaron's offended that um, they made fun of the movie on um, Mystery Science Theater three thousand. Yes. Yeah. I, um, Kim, who had you know obviously worked a lot over the years, yeah. and and we stayed friends as well. And she had a copy of I hadn't seen it when it was broadcast, and um, she had a copy of it. The guy sent it to her because I think he. It, if I remember right, she was a guest. Yeah. Um, is that true? I think so. Well, it's uh, we sat there together, uh, like little kids watching it with popcorn and stuff at her place. Um, mm -hmm. I love and mm -hmm. laughed our asses off because yeah. it's funny that movie. It, it on some level it's not Aaron's fault, but there was just no money, and there are points when it was inept. And there was a guy named Rocky who was our stunt coordinator and Linda Blair's coke dealer. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so she was on that, that set as well. Um, it got pretty wild, but we all had a really good time. And we, I would have done every, anything Aaron needed me to do. Yeah. Uh, and he knew it. And so we all were like that. He's that kind of guy, for one thing. You want to you please him. You want to go the extra mile so he... He gets what he needs. He didn't quite get what he needed. The Android was simpler. Yeah. I mean, I I was a you know a stunt extra on that movie just just to pitch in. Mm -hmm. So I'm in some fist fights and stuff because I could do them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that's the kind of guy he is. I I still would. 
I, I'm out of touch with him. I'm sorry to say. Is he still directing? Um, he's doing TV mostly. Um, you know, he yes. pro- he produces more than he directs. Yeah, yeah, I know he got involved in several of those. I did work for him again on some TV thing. I played a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Again, I would have done anything he wanted me to do. I still would. Yeah. Um, and we were family friends in a way. It, it, it was a family, it was a community that was quite tight for a while. Mm-hmm. I love the uh, journalist you play in Francis. Oh, that's one of my favorite roles. Yeah. Ever. And and that was, again, the casting actors, uh, I mean, I knew a lot of these folks on a, on a personal level. And yeah. uh, Elizabeth Lustig and Jane Jenkins were the casting directors, and I adored them. Um, and and uh, Elizabeth, again, she called and said, we have the perfect part for you. Mm-hmm. And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, well, you're really sweet, and then you're a you're a snake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for me. Yeah. And in fact, I didn't audition. Uh, they just went to the Graham Clifford and said, "We got the guy." And he goes, "Fine, I trust you." And uh, and I loved that part. So it was a real it was a real guy. Yeah. Who worked for for Luella Parsons and was a sleaze. Mm-hmm. And you know his job was to go out and get the the most uh, out, out, outrageous, scandalous story I could find. She printed, right? And so she sent him to New York to check out what was going on around Francis Farmer, who who was about to be a big movie star and who just split. Yeah. And went and done did theater. She had visited Russia. You probably know this, right? Yeah. And you know, the Moscow Art Theater and wanted to be a real actress. And she was super smart. Mm-hmm. And, right, so, so, I showed up to do the scene and uh, that big party scene, there's, I have two main mm-hmm. scenes, uh, as I remember, but there's a big party scene, which is when Francis first comes back mm-hmm. to Hollywood. Right? right, and I go up to her and say something just horrible and you know sleazy, mm-hmm. and uh, and before the scene though, oh, before the scene goes, I I knew Sam and I knew they were starting to get it on, and I knew Sam's wife, and I mean I was <laughs> uh, close to Sam. Uh, this community, uh, the theater community, we all knew each other, and uh, so. I went up to her and put my hand out, Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, and I said, um, hey, I just want to introduce myself, we're about to do the scene, and then, you know, I know Sam, and she goes, my hand is literally still out. And she looks Mm -hmm. at me and she says, I'm aware of that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fuck. And, you know, I limp, and I just sort of backed away, went, okay, well, uh, you know, See in the scene, and then I realized we had just had a great rehearsal for that scene. Because mm-hmm. in the scene, she says, "You seem like an intelligent young man. Can't you find a decent line of work?" Just murders the guy. And I realized that if she had done the normal, uh, you know, shaking hands, friendly you know, thing before the scene, she would see me more as a human being. But she doesn't see me as a human being at all. And if I am, fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) The story had already come out in the paper. Right. I had gleaned from her in in the first scene of the movie, but it shot reverse, obviously. And she just had, you know, turned me into a bug. And it was great. The scene was great because of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of actor she is, right there, in a nutshell. And so, the next scene, though, is the one where she's really sweet to me at the beginning. Because mm-hmm. I seem like this little, this great, you know, young man who wants to be an actor and has got a flower for her and that kind of thing. Yeah. And we walk mm-hmm. along, and she's being really sweet. She says, "Well, if you don't want to, if you want to be an actor, don't." Don't go into show business. <laughs> and I stop, 
And I say, oh, what would your husband think about that? And, yeah. she, and it's literally a cut to her for a minute and back to me and I'm a different human being. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a component, as, as Liz said, I'm a snake. Yeah. She knew you were a fraud. <laughs> then all of a sudden, with a line, just <clears throat> cut away, we're back, boom, like magic, a whole different person talking. Now that morning, it, that, that was shot all night, when I showed up in the makeup trailer, and it's just me and her that night, and she's there, and as I came in, keeping in mind that the beginning, in the beginning of that scene, she's very sweet. Mm. She greets me. I was scared. <laughs> but I come in and she said, oh, how great to see you. Uh, um, Sam says hi. You know, she's like that. And, and so that when we went to do the scene, she could be that way with me. So the woman is never not working. It's all for the work. Yeah. Well, she's brilliant. And I'm so impressed with her because of that. And, you know, I don't know, maybe a year later, I got a call from Tony Richardson's office, my, to my agents, mm. saying, Jessica and Tony are having a reading of the script for their movie they're making, Blue Sky, and they wonder if you would go up to his place and read both of the male leads. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones and, and uh, Powers Booth were the guys. So clearly, I'm not right for these parts. But yeah. they wanted an eye on, they wanted to get some feedback on this script. Yeah. And it included me. And I had directed many of Sam's plays, and he and I were close. So there mm. was that. They knew they could trust me on some level. And that what I might have to say would be of some sort of use. Mm -hmm. So they had me up there. And, uh, it was great, and, and and I saw there was a flaw in the script, and uh, I said so. But and they they took it well, <laughs> you know what I mean? They, go, yeah. huh. they didn't change that, and and it was attacked for this very reason. I mean, attacked. It it didn't quite succeed for the the reason that I pointed out. I'm happy to say, um, <laughs> but but that said, what it showed me was. The real, I mean, she's such a hard worker mm -hmm. and has never given her, you know, never stopped. Look at the, sh the stuff she's doing with that guy. What's his name, <laughs> that director? Um, the, the ones, American Horror Story and stuff. Oh, I know who you're talking about, yeah. Um, I, I can't place his name. Yeah. Yeah. But she does such... Uh, courageous work with her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't care, you know, she'll do what's necessary. And I really, I think that's, that's, that's her main thing. Uh, so it was a joy to work on that. And Graham Clifford and I stayed friends, and one of my next gigs was Fairy Tale Theater. Uh, Fairy Tale Theater. <laughs> yep, that's the first time the I ever saw you. Head. Yeah. He was the director of that. He, he, he asked for me for that. Again, uh, they just, you know, they just came and said, you want to do this? Like Mary Steenburgen and Malcolm McDowell, you're kidding me? Yeah. There. And then Diane Ladd was in it. Uh, John Vernon. mom. Yeah, Francis who kept, Bay. Who kept uh, cleaning the, the log before she put it on the fire. Yeah. Which is all her. That was just her bit. Um, yeah, and Mary and... Malcolm remained friends, especially Mary, because uh, she was on the vineyard um, always, and uh, and I was there too for summers for years. Um, and Ted, a good man. Anyway, yes, that gig was also fantastic. I got to do got to kiss Mary and mm -hmm. do slapstick with John. What's his name? And, John Vernon. And, what's his name? John Vernon. Vernon, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was a hilarious guy, and nowhere near m me, nothing like me, the, the, his persona. Yeah. He had that face, you know. Um, yeah, so, so that was a joy, that one, and it's lived on. 
I mean, I could show that to my kids. They were, you know, finally impressed <laughs> when they were little. Yeah, I used to watch it uh, over and over again when I was a kid, and I still put really? it on. Yeah, I still put it on once in a while. Not just that one. I put on that one. I, there's a lot of them. I like Three Little Pigs, Cinderella, uh, Thumbelina. Yeah. yeah. They're wonderful. And, and Shelly, it was a brilliant idea. Yeah. And, and early on, I mean, again, Shelly is a very smart woman. Yeah. And uh, the, the woman who produced that, Bridget Terry, it remained a, a dear, dear friend of mine and became a partner, actually, a producing partner of my wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, Susanna, and um, she came to a play I was doing at the Od- Odyssey a couple of years ago. I mean, we stayed uh, more or less in touch all these years, and it was from that. It was from the Re- Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah. I think that's the other thing about show business people might not kind of quite get how much many of those friendships uh, remain. Yeah. Uh, I could still call most of those people and and ask them to do something they'd probably do it yeah as well as it's, it's, it was a smaller community back then you know but uh that's true th- the relationships you made back then yeah i mean they last for a lifetime that's right or, or if not they you can re-up them very easily I, I used to do a lot of readings and events like the wizard of oz and mm-hmm. and I could call any. I did, in fact, call all of those people asking to do it. Mm-hmm. There wasn't money involved. It wasn't. It was because we had developed a certain amount of trust over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Joel Gray is the wizard. <laughs> I was just a flat out call before I even finished the sentence. He was yes, uh, Ellinger, of course, but uh, all of them. Um, mm-hmm. That. That is also a thing about show business that I was really lucky in, in the sense of I could, I, done, I behaved well enough that I could still <laughs> talk to them and ask them to do something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, more or less. So what, what's next? Uh, one more movie I wanted to bring up. This is a movie I I love, and it makes it still makes me laugh. It still holds up. Uh, you played a dead body in Men at Work. Yeah, Men at Work. <laughs> you knew that was coming. You what knew it was coming. Friend. Yeah. Oh my God! I got laughs dead. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I got laughs as a corpse, and that that's a, it's like Weekend at Bernie's. I mean, in fact, yeah. Um, <laughs> LA Weekly did a list of the the ten funniest do, uh, dead movies. Yeah, and my uh, and Men at Work was number two. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Weekend at Bernie's, of course, was the classic, and that was number one. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay, the story behind that is that I knew all those the Brat Pack guys. Yeah, uh, but I t- particularly loved Judd, Nelson, and, and Emilio. Mm-hmm. And so the years pass, and the woman who cast that uh, is a woman that I also stayed friends with, um, whose name, of course, because I'm 70, is blank. I'm blanking on right at this moment. Uh, anyway, uh, so again, she calls, she said, Melia wants you to do this thing, and it's, it's kind of weird. Uh, so I'm going to let him tell you. So I met, we met, and he said, okay, here's the deal. This guy in the first 15 minutes of the movie, it looks like a movie may even be about him. And then he <laughs> dies. They kill him. But then you're, you've got to be carried through the whole movie, literally, uh, as a corpse. And I went, I'm there, whatever you need, dude, whatever. You need. And I got paid for a full, you know, he <laughs> paid me as if I was still in the movie. Yeah. Um, and I am still in the movie. There's a mm-hmm. lot of that, uh, that... Part of it was just the physical challenge of it. Yeah. That scene where the cops come up and are yelling in my face. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? John and Pletch and Tommy Hinckley. Yeah. <laughs> and that actor just loved trying to break me up. He, he got a he was spitting on me mm-hmm. right up in my face. Yeah. And that also became the fun of it was can we break Daryl up? 
And yeah. it, and also, as I said, I would do anything a million. And so at one point he said, can you be in an oil can? Can you stuff your whole self? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Let's try. <laughs> and and I, damned if I could. And it's a great shot of me in that oil can. Yeah. That, you know what I mean? That, yeah. I'm mean, not that the movie depends on it, but it's, and also since I did have scenes where I actually was walking and talking and uh, that adorable girl was my girlfriend. Yep. Uh, what's her name? Leslie Hope. Oh, yeah, and she's still working. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, she was, bless you, Hope, right on. Uh, so, uh, and or a couple times he would also, if, that weren't in the script, he would say, he came in at one point, and it's a regular kitchen cabinet set up, and he said, can you get in that cabinet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you take the fucking uh, shelf out, I probably could. You know, so they did. They took the shelf out, and they even gave me a little extra room inside by taking a wall you can see out. But it still was not easy to get in there and stay in there while the shit's going, the change is going on, and then you know have them have to play me being there. So, um, so that became the the fun of that. I got to do slapstick and and stuff um, early on. I remember the thing with the car. It's one of those seatbelts that moves oh, yeah. automatically. Yeah. yeah. And I get all hung up in the seatbelt. I don't know if you remember or not. I think I you it's remember. In there. It. And it yeah. became a bit, getting hung up in the seatbelt. But that just happened in rehearsal on by mistake. And he was like, <laughs> well, keep it, keep it. So there was a lot of that. Uh, in that movie. Yeah. <clears throat> I met the Keith... penultimate. Go oh. ahead. I was going to say, I met Keith David at a convention a couple of years ago, and when I brought the movie yeah. up, he could not stop laughing. He was like, that's one of my favorite roles I ever played. You know, because he had just done Platoon with Charlie, and so he kind yeah, wanted yeah. to, he wanted to kind of make fun of, of, you know, being a Vietnam veteran. Right. Yeah. Oh, he was just fantastic. And, but the truth is, and literally, he carried me through the movie. I mean, yeah. he's, he's carrying me around. And, and I fucking loved it. And I didn't try to be light, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and it became a, a, a routine with us, too. Of, you know, at one point, how long am I going to have to carry you through this goddamn movie? Yeah. As long as you can bear it, man. Um, and also, at a certain point, there were shots there were stuff that a- anybody could have been under that mask the richard nixon mask yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they got a body double to be you know yeah. honest uh it's not me all the time i was losing my mind a little bit yeah. uh you know having to just be a <laughs> comatose and beyond um but the other kind of sweet part of the story is then they wanted a, just a shot of me in the limo. Yeah. Right, when they look over and there he is dead. Oh, uh, yeah, with the champagne glass. Is that? You had a champagne that, glass. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That was, uh, that was my idea, honestly. But, yeah, the whole thing was just delicious. Uh, mm-hmm. But that wasn't in the original script. So... Uh. I get this call. Uh, we got this thing we need you to do. We're shooting it in a dump. And unfortunately, we're shooting all night. And, you know, we would, we really need you. Mm-hmm. And I, so, I, again, I would do anything, you know, wanted, needed. So I go down there, but I'm sick. I'm sick as a dog. Uh-huh. And obviously, it takes all night. And, uh, but I'm so sick, and they didn't, again, they didn't have great, you know, big amounts of money, and this reshoot was kind of way over, and it had all the, and they didn't have enough uh, places in the honey wagon for everybody. Not, they, you know, in any case, 
I was in one of the smallest ones, and in fact, you couldn't really lay down in it. Yeah. And I was literally sick as a dog, and I can't lay down, and I'm exhausted, and I'm sweating, and, and uh, I start to get a little disgruntled. Mm-hmm. And they need to take me, take us both, Charlie and I, up to the location. And to be honest, Charlie wasn't my favorite person. Mm-hmm. He was, he was kind of a dick. And he was doing Emilio a favor being in the movie, yeah. et cetera. He's the movie star. Yeah. And, and um, and he, you know, say this, I, he, may have, he may be dyslexic, yeah. Charlie. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, on it, really, I, I mean, he may be, because he, he, all those guys are super smart. Martin mm-hmm. and the, the daughter, I don't remember her name, but there's another brother. They're super smart, super good people. I've done political stuff with Martin. And yeah. Charlie just wasn't like that. And I had a feeling he didn't read. Because a couple of times we said something, somebody says, I uh, 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 you know, kind of shrugged. So, I don't know. We didn't get along, really. Um, we stayed, we sort of kept our distance. Um, but we're riding up in this, in a different limo, you know, in a station wagon. And I'm really, hey, I'm, I'm just really fed up. It's four in the morning and I'm worked all night. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't say anything. I'm just back moaning all the way up the hill. And I, I started to get out, and I see Charlie go right over to me, kind of whisper to him. And Emilio says, oh, we're, we're going to change the first shot. We're going to get Daryl in the back seat right away. Mm-hmm. That's a bit of a flurry, because they were shut, they were setting up something completely different. Right. And Charlie had gone over there, and I don't think he even asked. I think he said, he told him, you got to do this. This guy's losing it. Yeah. Right? And immediately he was not aware I was sick. He had his own problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> directing this thing. Uh, but I really appreciated it. And I thanked Charlie later and he said, you know, you did a great job on this movie, man. I really appreciate what you did for me. He, he was just really a gentleman about it. That's good. Uh, which, yeah, which it really... You know, especially the way things went later, where, and he kind of lost his mind through cocaine and stuff. Um, Which is sad. Yeah, he, he, he turned out to be a really good guy. That's I've never true. seen anybody more comfortable on a set than Emilio. Mm-hmm. He grew up on sets. Yeah. Did you? He, did... You know, he could do everything. He could have shot that movie. <laughs> I mean, he could have been the, the cameraman. He was all over the, the thing. And I don't know, really really still very have a lot of affection for him. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Did you, did, so you didn't get injured at all, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Cause no, I, cause no I talked I, to, first of all, uh-huh, go ahead. I know how to do that shit. I do. I mean, yeah. like I, I did a movie called The Magnificent Seven Ride Again. Oh, yeah. With Gary Busey, mm-hmm. right? And there was quite a bit of shit that went down on that. It, it, in fact, I wrote something called Gary, me and Gary Busey rob a bank. And, <laughs> and we were high. <laughs> we smoked the joint before we went to rob the bank. And, and we're having a lot of fun, but we're jumping on horses and galloping around. And, you know, uh, well, we had a blast. Um, again, I'm, a, I'm the bad boy, although I appear to be the good boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was getting. I was <laughs> getting. The, uh, like in my shirt too. Uh, uh, sort of lead him, lead those Gary and his brother, who was the producer's son, uh, astray. Uh, whereas it looks like they're the bad kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I love that. I love that whole motif. But um, yeah, we almost got hurt. Seriously hurt. Uh, on that on that movie, but as we started it, the first couple of days, the the stuntman came up to me and he said, "Are you handy?" Mm-hmm. Like what? Are you handy? And I went, "Well, I, I don't know." And he, he said, "Can you do shit? Can you fall mm-hmm. off a truck or jump on a horse or take a punch?" Or and and I went, "Oh, oh, sure, sure, sure." So 
don't know what I, I could do, but I mean, I was certainly willing to do anything. And that's the, that, I love that that's how stuntmen find out if you can do shit. They come up and say, I'm Andy. Yeah. So, so during the... Uh, that's, mm -hmm. So when the pandemic um, isn't going on, are you still acting? Sure, sure. I did a little movie last January. Uh, and, you know, I went to New York. I changed my whole life. I stopped acting for a while. I thought I was just going to direct theater. I felt like they sort of made up their mind about me that I couldn't carry a picture. So, mm -hmm. they, But they couldn't put me in the background because I drew my, too much attention. Shit like that. And I did... A fair amount of work while I was there, actually. Law and Orders, three Law and Orders, I think. Stuff like that. But it was dwindling. And I was in New York. And they didn't know me like they knew me here. And the business had changed. Yeah. You, you, suddenly it's favored nations. Nobody gets paid anything if they're not a star. Mm -hmm. And so it all changed in my life. I was you know, I just... Finally came back to LA in 2013, and I was still fucked up from New York and from my life. Mm -hmm. And you know who's going to represent somebody in their 60s who never quite made it? But as it turned out, I got a manager through Facebook actually, yeah. and Jasper Cole, and he's a great guy, and he knew, he knows everything I ever did, and believes in me, and he gets me out. You know, I mean, now you don't go out. You just you know, I hate this. Yeah. Self tape thing. It's just a nightmare for actors. Oh yeah. Total fucking nightmare. First of all, I want to be in a room with the people to know that I really do want to work with them. Yeah. I I've always had that feeling of I want to work with people I want to work with. Not the other. You know, I, I don't. I'm not doing this. I never have done it for the money. Although obviously I want to make a living. Uh, but again, while I've been here, I've done all kinds of it. I never stopped doing it until it, right up to the epidemic, pandemic, the lockdown. I was doing theater, you know, one to the next. And good stuff, stuff I'm really proud of. I got to do Strindberg, and I got to play Hades in a kind of modern retelling of the Persephone myth. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I still work, and I did a, a low-budget movie called Kombucha Cure, which uh, Jasper is involved with this no-budget company that I've done in three <clears throat> films. But then the stuff came, and kombucha, they all kind of, everything just kind of shut down. So that thing is, is about, I think, three-quarters cut. Uh, uh, and when it gets done, it gets done. I have a great scene in it. I have a death. I, I have one scene in the movie, but it's, it's like Mike's murder. It's this long scene in which at the end I die. Yeah. So what what's better than that? You know, <laughs> I spit blood and drop dead. Very just a lot of fun. It was great to be back on this stuff. How how did how, stop. How, how did you get into teaching though? Um, I've always loved it. I love it. directing. In some sense, is teaching, mm -hmm. and uh, or sometimes it has to be. Um, and I've always been kind of theoretical. So uh, I knew some people in the film department at Columbia, and um, one, they called me and they said, we need somebody to teach how to direct actors for film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got it. I knew what they meant. And um, I said, oh, yeah, okay, I can do that. And, and I stayed there for 12 years. Um, and I... I there's people, Jim Ponsold, who directed that movie about um, uh, David Foster Wallace that the great kid did. Yeah. What's his name? Jason. Help me out. Jason something. Jason Priestley? Jason Patrick? No, the guy from, no, the guy from uh, I Married Your Mother. Siegel. Jason oh, Siegel Jason stars Siegel. in that movie. He's great in it. Yeah. Jim Ponsold. One of those guys and uh, a lot of my students went on to make features mm. and some of them are really good features um, anyway that yeah that experience was very fulfilling and then while I was in New York I also started teaching at New York Film Academy mm -hmm. great you know acting classes and some 
those people are working a lot too. And um, then, uh, I mean, I've always wanted to teach, and I, I, I taught a couple of different things, workshops based on Sam Shepard, mm-hmm. who became kind of my, kind of my, uh, he, he's my, my go-to uh, um, playwright. I knew him well. I directed about a dozen of his plays. I introduced him to Ed Harris, actually, mm-hmm. and they ended up collaborating several times. Uh, and I, I used to say, Ed is kind of the acting Sam. But then Sam became such a good actor in, in movies. Uh, and we stayed close. So I got to do the, a big memorial to him here in L.A., the live streams and all that stuff. We, yeah. Ed Harris is in it, Bill Pullman, and, you know. All the heavyweights. Alan Mandel. Yeah, all the heavyweights. Yeah, it, yeah, John Densmore. And, um, yeah, that, it was, uh, uh, to, to be close to him, it was really, less, you know, admittedly, or obviously, uh, the, the great playwright of that time, um, meant a lot to me. I've known a lot of great writers. That has mm-hmm. just sort of been a touchstone in my life. Some of the best alive, and including I married Bill Styron's daughter, so um, I had that connection to that world. Mm-hmm. Uh, do, do you? Do so, yeah, I'm still doing so. Do Do you get a satisfaction teaching that you don't get actually acting? No, it's not that. It's mm-hmm. a whole other satisfaction. Really, it's more like directing. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and and I'm never going to stop acting. I, I just got an email from Bill Irwin, actually, a couple of days ago. Bill Irwin? Saying, wow. <laughs> Irwin. Yeah. 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 Now, we've been friends since college. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we lived in the same town. We lived in Nyack. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the... The other people living in Nyack are like Ellen Burstyn. Oh, yeah. I played her son in a movie called Twice in a Lifetime. I remember that movie. And, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful movie. Uh, Gene Hackman. Brian Dennehy. And my dad. I played his son. Who? What could be better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Gene Hackman as your, son, as your father. And Brian um, Dennehy. <laughs> and Amy Madigan's in it. And Ali McGraw. I mean, Ali Sheedy. And, um, Brian Dennehy. Brian Dennehy. We just, uh, we just lost him. <laughs> Amy and, and Brian and I used to go out drinking. <laughs> Two Irish people and me. Yeah. And it was like, oh, God. But we, but Brian's very conservative. Mm-hmm. And we would have these shouting matches. I mean, it was fun. We, we, we were cracking up, but we were really yelling at each other in these bars. Uh... But I, I'm very fond of Brian, and I saw him several times in you know, O'Neill plays on Broadway. Um, and Amy uh, is really what is kind of my sister. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know what, what, what was your other question? Oh, about 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 you know your your love of of, of teaching over uh, yeah 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 it's a, it's 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 kind of wonderful to pass it on you know because mm. there is a way that that uh, to me theater is kind of a sacred endeavor well acting in general storytelling yeah uh, is kind of sacred we're doing something really useful it's not just entertainment or ego stroking or anything like that it's it, it's something that the, the the race and the culture really need mm-hmm. and it, we're fulfilling something important that gets kind of lost in the shuffle of the money but right. it's for real it's simply why I do it that's when money ain't great but sometimes yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> Some, uh, it, it hasn't been great lately, but I have a pension, and I, you know, I, I do fine. I, I don't have to worry about food and rent. That's good. Uh, like so many people do right now. 
Oh, I got uh, it. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Just interviewing tons of people, amazing people. Do you get money? Do you get money? No, I don't. I, well, I have another source of income, but I don't do it, you know, off of this. You know, I just, I just love what I do, talking to amazing people about their careers. That's wonderful, man, that you put this together. Yep, I do it four years. It'll be four years in May, and I, I love doing it. It's just, it's been a miracle. Well, you made it happen, though. It ain't a miracle. <laughs> I mean, I know what you mean. The podcasting like, world has been a miracle because, you know, this didn't exist when I was a kid, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because I, I grew up, you know, listening to the radio and stuff. I always wanted to be on the radio, but hey, this is the next best thing. Oh, it's, it's, in some ways it's better. It, it's, it's like I published a book. I published a memoir. Mm -hmm. and But I did it on Amazon. It's totally on my terms. Right. I, I'm, I'm able to say things and, and talk about things in it that I would have had trouble Right. And it, it's structured and sort of done in a way that's just really unusual. And I didn't want to offer it to publishers for get their okay. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that was not available when I was a kid, or that wasn't available 10 years ago. In some ways, it may be what saves books, uh, although they do keep twisting your arm to do a Kindle. Of course. So I would never do it. I want this to be something you hold in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's just almost as important, the, the sort of object it is. But, yeah, uh, I think pod things, uh, it is a little overwhelming. Yeah. With all the alternatives. It's hard. It's got to be hard to emerge. And uh, what, well, are you on sort of pod sites? I don't even know what that shit is, but. I don't do the um, the platform um, the the platform the podcast platform sites except for YouTube. Um, it's a lot easier and um, it's just I, I think it's more accessible for people to get to it. So yeah, right. build build up a following on that. I was curious though. You just mentioned the uh, the memoir. Is it out or is it going to come out? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Oh, it's been out for a while. Okay. Yeah, it's been out for uh, since. January. Oh, it's just a couple months. Okay. Yeah, it's called Person, Place, Thing. Mm -hmm. Way, Shape, Form. Which was kind of a slash in it. What? What? Between, mm -hmm. <laughs> what made you write the book? Between, well, I've been writing it for the last five years. Mm -hmm. Um, and and as I say, it's got a strange kind of structure. There's Several people have said <laughs> enthusiastically they've never read anything like it. Yeah, it, it sort of is going to need its own shelf because it's poems and I call it a poem memoir. Nice. It, it's it's journal entries and kind of experimental prose and flat out poetry and quotes from all kinds of sources, but like Proust and Walt Whitman yeah. <laughs> and you know like a lot of different sources and then there's movie commentary um, uh, but mostly on um, actors from the past mm -hmm. there's a long section and there's a long thing that has is in each section there's nine sections and there's a long thing called All the Doomed Blondes and it starts with Gene Harlow and it goes to Gene Seberg so, it all, you know, Francis, there's a whole, there's a section on Francis Fleming. And obviously nice. Marilyn is the main one, but Carol Lombard and, and Francis Farmer and all the, Kim Stanley. Mm -hmm. These women that I found to be kind of like the love goddess mm -hmm. and that we uh, crucify in a way. And... The culture needs her, but the culture also needs to bring her down. Yeah. And then the male component of that is is Montgomery Clift and James Dean and Marlon Brand. Right. And it's sort of a counterpoint. So 
Steve McQueen meant a lot to me in my life, and I happened to have a conversation with him mm-hmm. when I was around 19 on the phone. And it was about an hour long. And it really, get, he, he was always somebody I went, oh, wow, he's masculine in a way that isn't the He-Man thing. He's not John Wayne or you know, those guys, which didn't appeal to me at all. Yeah. But he, he seemed really masculine without being macho mm-hmm. and hip. So I always admired him. And, and uh, so that, that's detailed in the book of it. Well, I'm definitely going to check it out, Daryl, and this has been... I think uh, you'd love it, dude. Yeah. I really do. And there's some real outrageous shit in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nice, I like outrageous <laughs> shit. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Uh, a little bit I snuck in while we've been talking, but some of it is really goes out there. Um, so, yeah, that's that's me. I will definitely check it out, Daryl. This has been um, just spectacular. Please stay safe, and um, I, I I hope uh, you okay. get you get some uh, rules um, this year. And um, also, God bless you, and wear a mask. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I promise. I have gotten the both vaccine, vaccines. Yeah, I just, I, I just got now, my first uh, one. Have yeah. you got them, too? I got my first one a couple of weeks ago. I'm getting my next one in another couple of weeks. Good. Good. You stay safe too, brother. And uh, thank you so much for wanting to talk to me. Absolutely. You have a great night. Okay, man. Adios. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Daryl Larson. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? Oh my God, great stories about show business and very passionate about what he does. It was an honor to talk to him today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!